Okay, good morning. My name is Christy Artis. Like I was introduced as, I'm one of the therapists that works on the palliative care team, um, which our primary role is to offer counseling to parents. On the palliative care team at Cook Children's, we have you know physicians, doctors, nurse practitioners, a social worker, and then within Cook, we have a clinical therapy team that offers therapy to our patients. And the need to offer additional emotional support was identified by our palliative medical director, and that's how our role was created. And this is Lisa Patterson. We're the two therapists on the team. I'm going to take the lead on presenting this one, and then after this, she'll um, talk more about what palliative care in general is. But I am curious and need to know, like, who volunteered to talk about grief on a Saturday morning? So I'm wondering, like, who is here, if you could raise your hand, for personal connections to Dravet syndrome? Parents, family members, guardians? A lot, okay. And anybody here solely for professional connections? Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, I saw that there was, yeah, some future something going on at the same time. Um, so let me, uh, let my notes here. Okay, so I imagine that the committee that planned this conference is especially well informed and titled this session and wanted to do one on prolonged grief because that's actually a diagnosis that was just added to the DSM in the last year. And the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Health Disorders, so it's our holy grail in what are the criteria for diagnosing people for mental health disorders. And the speculation, I haven't seen this officially, but the speculation is, is that because of the pandemic, we have all experienced a great deal of loss and mourning got incredibly complicated by pandemic protocols. So as of right now, our world is just a whole bunch of people walking around with complicated bereavement and so I'm grateful to the American Psychiatric Association that added that diagnosis because it allows me to bill insurance for longer. But for the purposes of our 30 minutes together in thinking about grief as some sort of pathological disorder, it's not helpful because in reality, like all grief is messy and there's no way around it. All grief is complicated, all grief is prolonged, and like I said, we only need it in that manual so that we can get paid <laughs> to help. But it's really not helpful to think of some sort of disorder. Um, oh, let me go back. There we go. Okay, so a lot of you, most people are familiar with the stages of grief. So even mental health professionals are guilty of wanting grief to fit in nice, neat, orderly, predictable stages. But if you've ever experienced any sort of loss, divorce, pets, neighbors, jobs, family members, you know that you bounce in and out of these stages all the time. And that's the important point. Um, and then you combine this need to move in and out of all of the stages of grief with our American society that highly values efficiency and convenience and in society the space that's created for allowing people to move all around this grief process has gotten really small. We try to fit bereavement in short work policies um, that allow for a number of days out at work. We um, have gotten away from hosting funerals and now we host celebrations of life in lieu of flowers. We ask for donations. But in reality, like all of those things have existed for a long, long time because they were important. And if I could have my greatest wish come true, it would be that we would like wide open create space for people that are grieving. And we would go back to the days when you wore black for a week and everybody in your community knew that you were sad and you got more casseroles than your refrigerator could fit, and the whole town sent flowers, because that's an important part of moving through grief and assimilating a loss into your life. Um, I love this quote by Dr. Wolfell, and I needed to include it not only because I love it, but because I was, as I was training to be a therapist, I spent a lot of time 
reading his materials and even attending, you know, weeks worth of classes, learning from him. I really appreciate his um, philosophies and poly, uh, practices around healing people through grief. He's definitely considered a um, grief expert, national grief expert. And this quote, what this, you know, means to me is that those who can grieve well can live well and love well. Um, the only way to get through your grief is to go through it. So sometimes people come to classes with me and hope that um, what they're going to get is the ace in the hole, the silver bullet, the magic potion that keeps them from feeling any pain from loss. And if that is what you wanted this morning, like I cannot offer, I will never be able to offer that to you. Um, my plea to you would be to invite it in, to lean into the disorientation. And my nervous fingers keep moving me way ahead of where I'm at. <laughs> um, so the only way out is through. So we have to lean into the disorientation in order to come out oriented on the other side. If we go around, we're just gonna get pulled back. So an important thing is to, like the two greatest purposes of a bereaved individual is to both grieve and mourn, and there's absolutely a difference in these two essential tasks. So grief is personal. It's the personal identification of what is lost by you when you're grieving. And this is, again, any kind of loss, job, pets, divorce, family, children, whomever. Um, it's the quiet moments alone in your bed. It's the hiding your tear-stained face at work. It's the giving yourself time for the breakdowns when the breakdowns are actual healing. That's what healing looks like, allowing yourself to feel those things. And then mourning, as Dr. Wolfelt would say, is grief gone public. That's the funerals and the flowers and the memorials and the obituaries and the blog posts detailing the journey. That is people inviting you into your experience. And, you know, obviously I'm a therapist, so I'm gonna tell you feel it to heal it. That's why grief is important. And then the reason why mourning is so important is because our brain's job is to maintain homeostasis. It needs to maintain heart rate, blood pressure, temperature. And your brain doesn't wanna feel pain either. And so if it can deny the reality of what happened to you, it will for as long as possible. So what the flowers and the casseroles, the funerals, the anniversary celebrations, they force you to accept the reality of what's happened. When you skip that step, that's where we get, we block our own healing because um, we can lay, stay in denial for a long time. So I wanted to, I think people like stories, so I wanted to paint two pictures, two good examples that we've experienced on the palliative care team and watching people work through this process. So as Lisa's gonna explain, palliative care follows families for years that have any sort of life-threatening or life-limiting medical condition. Um, so we see lots of things and we you know, can start as early as diagnosis. We wanna be early in the process. And then of course we stay present for people past a bereavement period. Um, so a good example of a family that was mourning, that mourned really, really well, is a family who had a baby with a trisomy 18 diagnosis. And that diagnosis, I hate this saying, but it's one of those that's considered incompatible with life. That's the most brutal statement to say to a parent. But um, most babies with trisomy 18 are gonna die in utero. If they live, it's maybe a five to 10% rate that live past the first year. So this family that we were working with found out prenatally about this diagnosis and were incredibly thoughtful about what was important to them, what their values were, what quality life looked like. And um, their baby at about six months of age started having some respiratory setbacks, was getting admitted to the hospital more frequently, um, needing more intervention every time he came back. And around eight months of age, they decided for him to allow him to experience a natural death. And this family mourned so well. They had the Trisomy 18 community wrap around them and host events for them. Their church 
you know, totally, the, his memorial had to be at a park because it would not fit in a building. So many people showed up for them. Um, she had a blog post where she detailed their journey, lots of followers. Um, on, it was either his birthday or the anniversary of his death, they collected donations of baby items that their baby loved and brought them back to cook. Like, they even, this is a great idea by the way, came back and had lunch with our team. <laughs> they wanted to break bread with the team that, um, you know, had walked that whole journey with them. Um, but several months in, she's meeting one-on-one -on -one for therapy and one, like she's done all these things, you know, it looks as if she's assimilated this loss really well into her life and found meaning in the loss, but she's wondering why she's still not able to sleep at night, why she still can't picture a life without her son and why there's so much distress within her. And um, the reality is that she was terrified to get to the point where you fall on your knees and you get engulfed in the pain. She had really, gone too far with the morning and just distracted herself from the reality of what she lost. So for her, it was getting her brave enough to move backwards and to lean in to the pain that she was holding on to. Because the only way to get on the other side is to go through that. But people, even not just in grief and all kinds of therapy, people are terrified to feel their feelings because they're afraid it's going to swallow them whole. Um, and of course, it's our job to help them combat some of those thoughts and build some of that resiliency up. And then so to paint a picture for grief, this should be a quicker story. Um, a good example that I can think of is a family that had a daughter with severe cerebral palsy and for 19 years required 24-7 care from her mother. And similar to our trisomy 18 baby, um, their daughter was having frequent admissions to the ICU, everyone longer than the last, more intervention required every time. And by 19, they decided, you know, she had had enough and they wanted to allow her to experience a natural death. And this mom was so private, she would not tell her pastor, she would not tell her church, there was no obituary, there was no funeral, neighbors didn't know. Her husband and her son, who lived in her home, knew. And then her mother in Mexico knew. And then those of us at Cook knew. And I, she's the first person I think of when I think about grief without the mourning because she is the mother I spoke to the most that whole next year. We brought her back into clinic all the time, trying to support her, but she was really hard-headed. I mean, she needed more than to just do the mourning side, but by the time, she maybe a year after her loss, she created a t-shirt and put her daughter's picture on it. Um, I think she brought a cake back to our team and she created a flyer. And I don't really know what she did with the flyer, it doesn't matter, but all of these things were invitations to other people to join her in the loss. And for a year, she was abs she did not want to experience another day without her daughter, and um, understandable, of course, and she just could not figure out what to do with herself. But when she really started working and opening herself up, um, it took a long time, but she would finally you know, got back into work and did find I think she still carries her daughter, who was cremated with her everywhere, but she um, doesn't have those blocks to daily living like she did for a really long time. Um, so you guys are all family members, so, but this might still be helpful to you. This is sort of the script that I give when I talk to like the nurses or physicians at Cook and how to support parents within the hospital that are grieving um, is we, and I, get, I feel like I should point out, death is the easy thing to, talk, to default speaking to when you work in palliative care and uh, when talking about grief. But again, like grief starts, can start when a child's diagnosed with a medical condition. And that's why we love our role because we get to be there for the whole journey. Um, and so when people are even losing hopes, dreams, and expectations for children, we just need to remember that healing happens from the inside out. It cannot come from the outside in. So there's no need to tell people how to feel. There's no need to tell people where they should be in their grief process. What we need to do is sort of move back with them and tell them and let them tell us what's happening on the inside. Um, but people, again, want to know what's the, how, what's the magic potion, how do I get around the pain, you know, and as helping professionals, 
we wish we had that answer, especially the doctors and nurses. Like, they hear a symptom, they offer the relief, they offer the, med you know, the solution to that. Um, so it can be really hard to just be willing to move back and learn from somebody else about what they're going through. Um, the last point is one that I like to put on, which I imagine you guys have more experience with than I do and would just say amen to, is you know, relying on logic to be helpful is not helpful because things can absolutely be true that are not helpful. And helping professionals love to meet you with logic. But the reality is, is people need to get disoriented. And on the other end of that, they will come out with the logic, they'll come out with the truth, but just having it prescribed of what's true and what needs to be believed in that moment isn't helpful. So things like people want to beat you over the head with, but there's nothing you could have done differently, or this isn't your fault. Like all those things are true, but they need to believe for a minute that there's something they could have done. They need to wrestle with that. They need to suffer through it, and they need to come to the conclusion on their own, you know, and they'll get there. Um, so do always, for anybody in your life, encourage the use of ceremony. There's a saying of where words fail, ceremony steps in. Sometimes there's not words to put to things. So, you know, encourage the planting of the tree and the birthday cakes every year and celebrations. Um, you can help people identify the supportive individuals in their life. Uh, it's not always obvious who the great supporters of grief work are um, because even, you know, ecclesiastical leaders can get stuck on, you know, faith over fear and not allow people to feel the fear. Um, a mother can have her, a grandmother can have her own distress, her own grief, and so not be able to sit with somebody. So, so we have to, we can help navigate a conversation of like, who is the person that is really capable of sitting in silence and hearing what you're experiencing? And it might be surprising who that person is. Um, the other thing I would say for the people that just have to have an answer, for people that are hurting, um, two pieces of advice that I will give to parents in the hospital, because so many parents will say, I can't do this, I can't go another day, and I will say, yes, you can. But the two things that will make sure you don't are if you get dehydrated and you're not sleeping. So th there's the advice you can give. Set glasses of water out in the morning so that you have visual cues of staying hydrated. And so many people cannot sleep when they're hurting. So we just encourage, you know, close your eyes, put your feet up, go horizontal twice a day for at least 20 minutes. Give your body some time to rest so that you don't, you know, break down on yourself. So I wanted to give an example of empathetic statements because sometimes what people think is empathy is actually wildly minimizing. Things like, oh, that's normal. Well, this person is lost in that wilderness and they feel crazy. So telling them that this is normal is incredibly minimizing to what they're walking through right now. Um, abs, as a therapist, I would tell you, take the words at least out of your vocabulary. Nothing helpful follows a statement of at least. Pointing out the blessings, the positives, not helpful. Um, and of course, in therapy, there becomes a time where we have to pull people back out and like, OK, come on. But in acute crisis, in you know, grief in your short interactions with people, it's not helpful to encourage people to look for the silver linings and be appreciative for the plan that somebody might have put in front of them. What um, some statements that, of course, and don't tell people where they should be by now, it's been six months, or, you know, how you felt at the time. It's more helpful to say things, here's what we do say, Things like, tell me more about that. This experience sounds really painful for you. Tell me what it's like. Um, and of course, be willing to sit in the silence and tell me more. And another great thing to do is if you can think about this is moving people backwards. Um, anytime I meet with somebody for grief therapy, the first few sessions are always on, if it's the loss of a family member, um, tell me about that person bring pictures. Tell me about your favorite vacation. What was their favorite sport? What's your, what did you hate about that person? I 
if I'm going to help you, I need to understand the magnitude of what it is you lost. And if you really don't understand the magnitude of what somebody lost, like you're not there to give advice, you know, that is the first goal. Um, so if you can't sit in silence and you want some words, the questions about the lost individual can be helpful. People want to talk about this, you know. Um, and if they don't, they'll tell you, so don't be scared to ask. <laughs> um, and in that, in the thing about the truth, like what's true isn't always helpful. You know, people are beating themselves up with wishing they would have called 911 sooner or wishing they would have gotten to the doctor a year earlier. And um, instead of saying, well, that wouldn't have made a difference, where we just shut it down and said you shouldn't be feeling that way, you can say, what I hear is, if you could do anything to change this situation, you would. What I hear you saying is you love this person so much that you would have given anything for them to still be here. You can validate the experience. Okay, so here's some notes for the people that are grieving themselves. The goal, again, of grief work is not to go back to where we were. It's not to avoid feeling pain. The goal is to figure out how to assimilate a loss into a new life. This is especially if you're a bereaved parent. You, you don't go back to being a not bereaved parent. Like you're always a bereaved parent. Um, the loss of a child is so unnatural um, that trying to get back to what you were is impossible and would be unfair to try to expect of yourself. So we're working to create a new life with this person that's still gone included somewhere. Um, Grief work is incredibly slow and recursive, so you have to be extremely patient with yourself. Again, there's no rewards for speed. There's no set deadlines on where things should be, so you have to be patient and graceful with yourself. And even for therapists, if they don't have a lot of training in grief work, they can do some harm because some people just want to look forward. They just want to feel better. And some therapists are like, all right, let's go. Let's solve some problems and let's move. Let's go forward. But if they don't take the time to move you backwards to fully experience what you lost, that relief is short term. Um, in order to get some long term relief, there has to be the work behind you. So here are some helpful tips. For people that are grieving, create a routine. I, I think back to basics. This is also what I tell parents in the hospital. If you need, like when you would do for a toddler, when you had a checklist of get your shoes on, get your pants on, brush your teeth, take all the extra decisions and mental power of your day out. As many decisions as you can outsource, as many visual cues as you can remind you, because the capacity up here is going to be limited. So create a chart for yourself. Um, so that you can be reminded of what it is you need to do. Back to basics, get yourself a feelings chart. America, we are not great at identifying feelings. All people know is that they're either angry or sad, but if you look up a feelings chart, there's way more than that. And again, I'm a therapist, okay? This is how I talk, I talk feelings. So get yourself a feelings chart, label the feeling, acknowledge the physical toll, like something significant uh, a big demand is being placed on your body when it comes to attending to a loss, so the physical expectations of yourself may be lower. Um, I'm always going to encourage traditions. We're not trying to forget anybody that we've lost ever. Absolutely create ceremony and then find a way to release distressing emotions. When emotions cannot get released, that buildup causes chronic stress in their body. And that leads to all kinds of people start getting stomach aches. They start getting headaches. Um, I think in the descriptor of the descriptor of this session, I said like grief will work to get your attention if you don't give it attention. And that's the grief coming out. Like pay attention. It's the inability to focus in the conference, you know, <laughs> or wherever you are. The grief is going to work. Those are pay attention to. There's cues. There's something I'm holding on to that needs to get out. And releasing distressing emotions is so different for so many other people. Again, it's crying in your car when you're alone or um, punching pillows out of anger, crying to a friend. Um, some people use movement to just get that stuff out. It looks different for everybody. Of course, therapy is another tool to release distressing emotions. 
um, even though I say there's no timelines, I do, in the people that I have met immediately preceding a loss, I would say within the first six months, they are coming in to avoid the grief work. They want the tools and the tricks to stay out of the pain. So I tend to think therapy is not gonna be helpful until some of the natural disorientation has already happened. So getting in, I have people that, you know, I talked to, my mother was just diagnosed with breast cancer. I wanna come in so I can get ahead of the grief. I'm like, oh, there's no getting ahead of grief. Like, that's gonna be hard no matter what, my friend. Um, I don't say it like that. I'm a little nicer. But, um, so just know like rushing into the therapist's house is actually not the greatest plan. I will tell you, I think it's maybe this side, the time to incorporate professional help is number one if anybody is at a point of considering harming themselves or somebody else. If those feelings of not wanting to live without their family member are so strong that they really have a plan to hurt themselves or somebody else, of course, that's when we're going to engage a professional. But then the other thing is if somebody is crying, if somebody's sad, they're angry, they're bouncing around, like that's okay, that is the healing. It's when somebody gets to a point of months down the road and they're still not out of bed, they're still not completing the activities of daily living, um, maybe that's when you need a professional help. Maybe we've gotten into the complicated bereavement, but in reality, we don't go to therapy just so we can make the grief look pretty. Um, it's when it's harboring blocks, keeping you from being able to perform a job, keeping you from being able to parent other children, um, maybe that might be a point to consider therapy. Um, again, feel it to heal it. <laughs> and the chronic stress will manifest if we don't attend to it. So I want to know, I wanted to ask Lisa to come up here with me in case you guys did have questions or concerns about or thoughts for me on grief or therapy. Lisa's going to get more into palliative care, so if you have questions about that, she will cover that next. Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, my question is, the tricky thing with us, with Gervais parents, is that uh, grief, we, okay, several things. <laughs> There's not just one. <laughs> we don't have time to go over. So Sorry. You gotta, you gotta wrap it up, right? The, we can't do that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just that we don't have the time and space. You know, like, we don't, we don't have, I don't have a child who died, but I did because mm -hmm. he's different. So I'm grieving through it. You have to grieve, th it's complicated because you have to grieve through things, but I don't have the time and space because I have to care for him. What are your thoughts on that? So my first thought is then this is a- she, no Wait, she has something to go along with it, sorry. Is it sorry. similar, okay. Sorry, this is, this is what I was going to say because mine is more of a thought than a question. I myself am a medical social worker. I'm a mental health professional. I've worked in palliative care and group homes and things like that. And then I became a parent of a child with Dravet syndrome. And so I thought I had my coping mechanisms in my toolbox and like I knew how to do this and I'm an advocate of therapy. But guess what? When it's personal, it doesn't matter. Even if I could tell other people how to do it, I didn't necessarily know how to do it myself. So you have to figure out what works for you. I think what she's trying to say about how we don't have the time and the space and we don't necessarily have the death of our loved one yet that the outside recognizes, oh, this is the time to grieve, this is the time to mourn. It is a constant, daily, prolonged grief, complicated grief, and it's traumatic to be the caregiver of a child or an adult, especially I'm feeling that as my child is growing, it's even more traumatic because the gap between him and his peers is getting larger and larger. Mm -hmm. um, you need to feel, deal, and heal, but you've got to figure out what works for you. And so if you find a therapist that is not aware of intellectual disabilities or trauma or whatever, go find another one. It's very much an individualized personal thing. And also for me, I have experienced a lot of healing through EMDR therapy, which is like a different type. Just know that you have to take care of you 
because if you don't, you can't take care of your child. And just as she said, you, you would do anything, anything to go back and make it different, but we can't. And so I just want you all to be aware that even me, the professional that used to be like the director of social work at a hospital, I get it wrong all the time. And sometimes things are working and sometimes they're not. And it's okay. It's okay to feel. And that, do you remember that squiggly line <laughs> where it's like, this is your experience? Like, it's all right to not be linear or to not have your journey look like somebody else's. Does that help you, Mandy? Jean wants to add to that. Sorry. <laughs> Here's another parent who professionally. You guys are I, living and breathing it. I understand. It. Yeah, I was a school counselor. So we have all gone through the grief of losing a normal child. So like she said, we are all grieving all the time. And, and I, I recognize the stages in myself, the shock, the anger, the denial, the despair. And we came to a point where we had accepted that we had a disabled son and things were pretty rosy for a while. And then I just sort of want to warn the rest of you, if you have a normal child, I found myself going through grief again when my normal child went to college, fell in love, got married, had children. And it hit me, gee, my son Danny will never be able to experience this. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of doing this as an alert. Yeah. Right. Well, and I want you to know it doesn't mean that you didn't accept, it didn't mean you didn't do the work ahead of time that the grief caught you again, like you were looking at a new situation. And we, I think, call those grief bursts, like this sort of thing is going to resurface again. So absolutely. Um, um, before I get to the next question, I don't know if I'm supposed to be able to chime in or not, but <laughs> um, I, I, I'm hearing, you know, people get worried about um, our grief doesn't look like everybody else's, but you know what, I think the other thing too, and this is something that you guys probably know and hopefully are aware of and, and telling families like us that we do have the grief though and the thing is is that we're constantly going through it and our child has not died right for some of us but pieces i i look at it as like pieces of it have because we went through the death of the hope and dreams that we had of our child being neurotypical then we go through the death and I'm using the death word because it's this, the association with yeah. the grief. So then we go through the death that my child may never walk. My child may never speak. My child didn't hit this milestone. My child doesn't look like this child. All of your ne neurotypical children were always comparing, you know, and they say don't compare your, your child to somebody else's. And then when you have a disabled child, you really can't compare them to everybody else, but we're constantly, I feel like, feeling that death because we're not hitting the milestones, because we're not, and then we're losing, you know? Like, it took me a while. I was saving my wedding dress for my child, and then I'm like, why am I saving this? She's never wearing this. She's never getting, you know? Like, so that was like a whole nother emotional thing that I went through, and, you know, so you're constantly feeling that. So, like, I don't want anybody to ever think, like, my grief doesn't matter, I, my child's still alive, like, what you thought you had did die. Like, it's okay, when it's okay. When you look at, like, there's certain populations that we have this category called disenfranchised grief, people that sometimes in society we don't feel like are owed the same grief process, and the parents coping with significant medical conditions in their children absolutely fall in that group. They don't feel like they have the same space that other people that lost their children through a traumatic car accident do. Um, the right trained professionals will know that that's not true. But then I also, the parents that I work with, lots of times they're disenfranchising themselves. They want to tell themselves that like, well, I knew this was coming. Um, I could have expected these things. Well, at least my child's still here. And I'm like, oh, that thinking is not helpful. So just don't disenfranchise yourself. And, the right, you know, I do think grief needs, it's not all therapists can provide grief therapy because we also meet with parents that have sought counseling in the community and um, 
they come back with these terrible diagnoses that are not accurate because the reality is, is you're not sleeping because you're running medical procedures all night or you're attending to your child. Like, you really need somebody that can walk through. Under, I don't understand personally, um, but because I'm working with this population, I'm understanding that this is insomnia, not psychosis, you know? Um, and they get any of those, you know, mental health screens, parents at, you know, the height of, let's say, a medical crisis with their child, it's going to look terrible, but those diagnoses are not helpful, you know, so. So my name's Georgia, and my son is 37 years old, and he was just diagnosed with Dravet uh, 10 months ago. So uh, what I'm dealing with, first of all, I didn't know this diagnosis, and I, I always thought he was static. But I, but he broke his arm in December. He couldn't, wa you know, couldn't walk, and his walking is declining. So I'm dealing with a decline that I never thought I had because I didn't have the diagnosis. And I'm interested in the palliative care, and then what are the resources for us, for me to deal with grief because he falls. So I'm dealing with somebody, you know, as the Crouch Gate in the Parkinsonian. Um, walk and the, and he falls and he hits the top of his head and he hurts himself and it and he hurts himself so how do i manage i could use some help be like how do i manage this decline so you know because it's painful for him yeah. and it's painful for me too does that get covered in the how palliative care can be helpful um, i hope so <laughs> <laughs> and maybe if it doesn't, then maybe we can maybe answer it. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, many of you know we, we have the 41-year-old child, so we've gone through the grieving process. Um, and, of course, the decline makes for additional grief. But it, this has been very helpful to me because you get to see the steps and... Uh, but the other side of it is, and I have to be careful because men are always accused of, well, here's the solution, but <laughs> <laughs> there's been a lot of joy, too, in our life, and we met a lot of people like yourselves and families, and I've been involved in our ARC in our local area, so there are positive sides to it. And everyone has challenges in life, even with normal children. Ours are just different. I don't want to come across as, here's the solution, but there are some positive things, too. We're going to have the grief. We've certainly experienced it, and we still have new griefs, but just keep hanging on to the positive and the love. Your child comes, oh, mom, your daddy's home, you know, so that goes away with normal kids. They don't come and hug you when you get home, but so keep on the positive side, too. Thank you. Thank you. Do you guys need another minute? Uh, we're Do just one. Okay. Sorry. Does anybody have any? Okay. I would. I don't That's have a question as much as a comment. And um, when my son was in early intervention, his provider, you know, I was like, I can't stop crying. I'm crying all the time. Why is this going on? And she goes, you're grieving the loss of the child that you thought you would have. And I think that, you know, resonates with what they were saying over here. And, and then you were talking about going through the grief and all that. And I'm thinking, like all of us, well, we're never going to stop going through the grief. It's a lifelong process for us. So 